Welcome to the Evangelism Podcast. I'm Daniel King, and I'm excited about telling people about Jesus. Today, I have a very special guest with me, Dr. Larry Martin. Thank you for joining me on the Evangelism Podcast. Thank you, Daniel. It's great to be here. Dr. Larry Martin is one of the premier Pentecostal historians that are alive today. He has published extensively on the roots of Pentecostalism, looking at some of the great figures uh, throughout Pentecostal history. And he's a great revivalist and a crusader as well. And so not only is he a historian, but he puts the power of the Holy Spirit to work in his life and ministry. And so, Brother Larry, let's talk a little bit about the roots of the Pentecostal movement, and let's continue all the way through history to where we are today with what the Holy Spirit is doing today. So let's begin with Charles Parham. You've just published a brand new book, and this is the most beautiful book of all the books that you've done. I I love this book. It's The Unlikely Father of Modern Pentecostalism by uh, about Charles Fox Parham, and it's published by Whitaker House. And so uh, you have done extensive research into his life. Let's begin at the beginning. Who is Parham and what happened through his ministry? Well, I, I believe that Charles Parham is unquestionably the founder of the modern Pentecostal and charismatic movement. Some people like to spiritualize as if, you know, it just uh, came out of thin air the Holy Spirit showed up, but God used his people. And he used this man, Charles Parham, to be the father of the Pentecostal revival. Uh, he was, uh, uh, at first he was a Methodist uh, preacher and uh, didn't fit well in the Episcopal scheme of hierarchy. And so he left the Methodist church, became more or less a holiness evangelist and uh, was seeking, hungry for God, looking for more traveled all across the United States, went to Chicago where Moody School was and uh, Zion where John Alexander Dowie was, went to New York where, where uh, uh, Simpson was, went up to Maine, uh, Durham, Maine, and uh, just traveled everywhere looking for more of God, came back to Topeka, Kansas and started a little Bible school in an old mansion there and they were praying 24 hours a day and seeking the face of God, studying the Bible and that's where God showed up and the Pentecostal movement began on January 1st, 1901. Talk to me about that date in history and what led up to it and then what happened on that date. Yes, sir. The, the, the schools, I said, they had 24-hour prayer going. They, they studied, only studied the scripture. They didn't have any textbooks. They didn't study theology per se or or eschatology, or certainly didn't study science and math. They studied the Bible. So it was a, it was a great environment for God to do something special. And, and uh, Charles Parham had been interested in the idea of speaking in tongues. He had, he had encountered that up in Maine, and it actually published something about him in one of his earlier newspapers. And so he had a hunger in him for more of the Lord. And uh, he asked the students, he was going off to Kansas City to preach a, a meeting. He asked the students to study the book of Acts. And he asked them not to congregate together, but to study separately. Each go their own individual, private, uh, devotional time and study the book of Acts and find if there was any physical evidence that accompanied the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And the students studied, as he said, he came back, he called them together in their main meeting room and he began to question them what was their conclusion, and, and each of the students studying independently had pretty well come to the same conclusion that in the book of Acts, when people were baptized in the Holy Spirit, it was evidenced by speaking in other tongues. And so they began to pray that God would give them the baptism of the Holy Spirit as he was given in the book of Acts, that they would receive the Holy Spirit as the early apostles did with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And this sounds pretty common today among Pentecostal charismatic people, but at that time, that was an, an unord- a very out of the ordinary thing because uh, people had spoken in tongues throughout church history, but they only saw speaking in tongues as being a, a manifestation of the spirit like falling in the floor or laughing or something like that. They didn't see it as anything beyond that. 
And uh, there were even people that called themselves Pentecostal that, that didn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But as far as anyone tying the experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the experience of evidentiary tongues, no one had done that to this point. And so this was uh, pretty revolutionary. It was uh, caused a paradigm shift when it happened. And it was on January the 1st. Look, before we get there, okay. let, let's talk a little bit about the book of Acts. All right. Because let's just go through and, and look at how the Holy Spirit was poured out in the book of Acts. Because this is what they were doing on that day. They were just reading. They, they didn't have textbooks. They're just reading the Bible. They're looking at Acts Correct. and looking at how the Holy Spirit was poured out during the early church and believing that God could do the same thing today. So Acts chapter 2, you have the day of Pentecost. The 120 disciples are in the upper room, and they're all waiting for the Holy Spirit. Jesus told them, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be by witnesses. And he told them to go to Jerusalem and wait. So they're there waiting. Day of Pentecost, suddenly there's a mighty rushing wind, there's tongues of fire, and they all begin to speak in other tongues. They're all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they speak with tongues. Then Peter goes and preaches, and 3,000 people are saved that day. All right, then you have Acts chapter 4, which I like to call the, the Jerusalem refill. So Acts 4.31, it says, When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Okay, so some of the same people that had been filled on the day of Pentecost right. were probably there in Acts 4 getting filled again. Then you have Acts chapter 8 when it says that when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard what was happening in Samaria and that they had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. So when they Peter and John had come down to Samaria, they prayed for them that they may receive the Holy Spirit because they had been baptized. The, the evangelist Philip had gone. He had baptized them, but they hadn't been filled with the Holy Spirit yet. And so Peter and John laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. And there must have been some type of physical manifestation because when uh, Simon the sorcerer saw what was happening, he was amazed, and he actually wanted to pay money in order to receive it. So there must have been something physical that was happening there in Acts 8 to catch the attention of Simon the sorcerer. That's exactly right, Daniel. Then you come to Acts chapter 9 when... Saul meets Jesus in the Holy Spirit. So he's on the road to Damascus, and uh, Saul is, is hit with a blinding light. He sees a vision. He's knocked off his horse. He's blinded. He, he is, uh, uh, Jesus appears to him and tells him to go to Ananias. And so Acts 9.17, it says, Ananias went, with, uh, went his way and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came, he sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we know that Paul spoke in tongues because later on he says, I pray in tongues more than all of you. That's correct. And so he was filled with the Holy Spirit and he spoke in tongues. Then you have Acts chapter 10 at the house of Cornelius the Gentile. And so Acts 10, 44 and 48 says, While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Then Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that there should not be baptized who had received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. And so what's really interesting, Peter is in the middle of preaching. And as he's preaching, he hasn't even finished his sermon yet. The Holy Spirit is poured out upon them and they all begin to speak in tongues. And these are Gentiles. And it was just like on the day of Pentecost. They right. began to speak in tongues, just like on the day of Pentecost. And it really amazed all of the, the Jews, those who were circumcised, because they thought it was this was a gift only for the Jews. Now, what's really interesting is that in Acts 8, with the Samaritans, they were baptized in water. Then when they the Peter and John came and laid hands on them, then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now in Acts 10 with Cornelius, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit first, 
And then he says, why shouldn't they be baptized in water? And, and so that tells me that God is not concerned with the order so much as he is concerned with getting his spirit into every person. Right. And so some people, um, you know, they want to be very analytical and, and, and analyze everything that God does. And so you have like the, the order of salvation. First this happens and then that happens and then that, that happens. But it seems like to God, the order doesn't matter so much as just, I want everyone to receive everything that I have to give. Another important lesson there in, in those verses, Daniel, is some people would teach that water baptism is essential to salvation, that there's some salvation saving grace in water baptism. But it's clear here they receive the Holy Spirit before they receive water baptism. Jesus said that the world cannot receive him. So obviously these people were saved and they were saved apart from water baptism. Uh, although it's important to obedience, uh, the most important thing is that we receive Christ and be baptized in his spirit. And then another time the spirit is poured out is Acts chapter 19. Uh, verses 1 through 7, and then it says, When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and then Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men there in Ephesus who received. Now, just recently, you and I were together in Turkey, right? and we got to go to the, the Agia Sophia, the, the church building, there, built by the Orthodox Church that for a thousand years was the largest building on earth. Well, while we were there, I flew down to Ephesus and I got to walk the, the streets of Ephesus and it was so cool being there in that place. And I was thinking about these 12 men that had received the Holy Spirit. And what's really interesting here in Acts 19 is that uh, they receive the Holy Spirit, they speak in tongues, and then they prophesy. And so along with the, the speaking in tongues, which is a physical manifestation of receiving the gift, you have the other gifts of the Holy Spirit. So you've got uh, prophecy, uh, uh, gifts of healing, uh, you know, words of wisdom, words of knowledge. All these things come when the Holy Spirit comes upon someone. Uh, exactly. And something else, Daniel, about Acts 19 I think is really important. And uh, that's in the, in the, the, the wording, the translation. Uh, most modern translations of the Bible, I'm certainly not against translations and I'm not uh, kind of a King James only guy, but most translations phrase that, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's the NIV, almost all the new translations say, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? But the actual Greek of that is, having believed, did you receive the Holy Spirit? And it is clear in the original that there are two separate incidents. You become a believer, you're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And a lot of people have taught over the years that when you're saved, you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, when you are saved, you do receive the Holy Spirit. He's with you. He, he was uh, active in your salvation. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a second and distinct work of God's grace. And that's proven by the original writing there in Acts 19. And so I think these instances of what God did in the book of Acts is not just something that happened historically. I, I think this is not just description, but this is proscription for today. The Holy Spirit is God. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In Malachi 3, 6, God says, I am Jehovah, I change not. And so the Holy Spirit doesn't change. And so the same Holy Spirit that was poured out in the book of Acts is available to people today. God does not change. The Holy Spirit doesn't change. You can't say that something happened in Acts but is not needed today because God has given us His Word so that we can understand the Holy Spirit, so that we can understand who He is, how He operates, what He does. And, and so I think that it's very valuable what these early Pentecostals did. They went to the Word of God and they formed their theology based on what they saw in the book of Acts. They, they were reading God's Word and they were, were thinking, okay, if we want to be like the early church, what practice should we have? Right. And, and I think sometimes in the modern church, we have our theology, 
and, and then we go and try to impose our theology on God's word. And that's where some verses get thrown out or we say that is not for today. But really, I think what we should do is we should let God's word form our theology rather than trying to force our theology to shape how we read God's word. Uh, th that's right, Daniel. What, what I teach uh, when I teach this, and I will uh, be doing that in the morning, I think you're going to join us over at the church, but uh, what I teach is they were not an experience looking for a doctrine. A lot of times today, as you said, we bring our theology and then try to make the Word of God comply, but we also do that with our experience. People have some uh, supernatural experience and then they try to look for a scripture to prove that experience. And these people went to the scripture first. They found the experience in scripture and then began to seek an experience according to God's word. And I think that's the, that's the most important distinction there, that their, their hunger was to see God do what he had, had done in the past. And not just, they weren't just seeking speaking in tongues or this baptism of the Holy Spirit. They, they called themselves the apostolic faith because they wanted a restoration of everything that happened in the book of Acts. All right, so let's get back to the, the historical fact. We, we went to Acts, so we went all the way back to first century Holy Spirit. Now let's go back to 1901 and, and tell us what was happening that morning in uh, January 1st, 1901. It, it actually started on December 31st. The, the group that met with Palm, they had a church there where they met in the old mansion, the Stones Mansion, and they were having a watch night service. A lot of churches don't do this today, but even when I was a kid growing up, we always had a watch night service on December the 31st, and we would sing and preach and pray and tried to at midnight when the new year started to have a prayer meeting and pray in the new year, pray the old year out and the new year in. That's what uh, Parham's group was doing. They were having uh, watch night and sometimes around midnight. And, uh, you know, I've probably researched this as much as any body possibly could and I can't tell you if it was before midnight or after midnight or or at midnight I just say around midnight they were praying and a lady at the school named Agnes Osmond uh, she was uh, had done uh, gospel work she was uh, by the way all the students there they were not like Bible school students out here at ORU that were 18 20 years old these were mostly mature adults that had been in the ministry uh, most of them had uh, done various kinds of gospel work, pastoring and other things. And Agnes Osmond was a, uh, a recognized gospel worker. She had a sister that was a missionary and uh, actually died on the mission field. And so she was, a, she was a mature woman of God. And she asked Charles Parham if he would pray for her that she might receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as they did in the book of Acts with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. And, at first, Charles Parham hesitated. Uh, he himself had not had this experience, but he agreed and decided he would pray for her. And when he laid hands on her, Agnes Osmond began to speak in tongues. And that moment when she had that experience was the birth of the Pentecostal movement. She was so baptized in the Holy Spirit that she spoke in tongues for days. She couldn't speak in English. They would give her paper and she couldn't write in English. She'd write they called it writing in tongues. I've seen some copies of it. It looks some, something like chicken scratch, but uh, that's what they said she was writing in tongues. And over the next few days, revival broke out there in Topeka. A number of people, Charles Parham, a number of others received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It was such a, a phenomenal thing that newspapers came from all across America, uh, from Chicago and from uh, uh, St. Louis and Kansas City, newspapers came, and this revival was front page news that God was pouring out His Spirit in a powerful way. So that that was how the movement started. That was the first day. Okay, so then talk to us some about the history of Charles Parham. You've written a, a great book on it, um, Charles Fox Parham by Dr. Larry Martin, and uh, you, you go into some of his history. He, he was flawed as a human being, as all of us are, but God used him. What happened after the Topeka outpouring? Several things uh, th that are important to note. One is Charles Parham believed that when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues that they could go anywhere in the world and preach without learning a language. 
that didn't happen as they expected. It would have been useful as a missionary it, it would to be have great. that. And it does happen yes. on rare occasions, but it didn't happen generally as they thought it would. And the other thing is he thought that this revival was going to be immediate and massive, and it wasn't. In fact, uh, he and his wife went to Kansas City and they ended up then going to Lawrence, Kansas, trying to hold meetings, trying to start another school. And almost everything he did uh, failed. He had a child that was sick and he was a faith healer. They didn't believe in going to doctors and his child died. And that was an extremely uh, difficult season for them. Uh, they they become unpopular. They, his wife says they almost starved to death for a season. It was It was a very difficult time. The movement was real, the experience was real, but the timing wasn't what he thought it was. And uh, they wandered around in that uh, spiritual wilderness for a while, and they ended up in a little town called El Dorado Springs, Missouri. And El Dorado Springs is one of those places in America that has a natural spring that back 125 years ago, people thought these spring waters would bring healing to them if they had whatever, rheumatism or arthritis or whatever, they'd come to those springs. And so here, Parham is a faith healing, faith healer praying for the sick. What better place to go than the place where all the sick people are? So he, he sets up meetings in El Dorado Springs and he has an a apartment that he's rented there and he's preaching the gospel at the springs. There's a lady there named uh, Mary Arthur. She was from Galena, Kansas. And Mary Arthur was really sick. She had intestinal plumbing problems. She was blind in one eye, going blind in the other eye. Uh, she didn't want to be there that summer. She had been there twice before. It didn't help her, but she was so sick, her husband insisted that she go and try to be in the water one more time to be healed. And She heard Charles Parham preach, and faith rose in her heart. She went over to the place where he was living, staying, praying for people. And Charles Parham prayed for her. Well, she was so blinded that she had pain in her eyes when she saw the sunshine. So she would cover her eyes up when she was outside. And she left Parham's home and she had a grandchild with her that was leading her back to her place. And the grandchild flitted off the way children will do. And she's there on the street by herself and she can't see. And she's crying out for the child. And in desperation, she takes this cover off of her eyes. And when she did, she was completely healed. Her eyes were like 20-20. She could see perfectly. and. Not only that, but she soon realized that everything else that was wrong with her was well. Every malady, it's like God had done a complete overhaul in her. And she was so excited, she went home, invited Charles Parham to Galena, Kansas. And he came there, he preached at her church, which was a Methodist church, he preached at her house. Then they put up a big tent, and he preached in the tent. And that wasn't big enough. They rented a storefront, it was two, two separate buildings separated by a wall took this wall out, had this massive hall, and hundreds of people came to Christ. Hundreds of people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Miracles and healings. What he had thought would happen in Topeka three, four years before now begins to evidence itself in Galena, Kansas. And real Pentecostal revival broke out. It spread from Kansas over to Joplin, Missouri. Hundreds were saved and baptized in the Holy Spirit in Joplin, Missouri. And all around that uh, four-state area there, uh, Kansas and Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, all of that area, God was moving. And, and during this season, he received an invitation to go to Texas. And he went to Texas. It's a, a long story. I won't tell it all. But he went to Texas. He was sick when he went there. God touched his body. Revival broke out in a little town called Orchard, Texas, till almost every person in Orchard was saved. Almost every family in the town was saved. And that's when Pentecost really began to move. I, I say it was born in Topeka and it crawled around in Kansas and Missouri and Oklahoma. It got to Houston and it stood on its feet and started walking because from Orchard they went over to Houston, Texas, had a great meeting in Houston and uh, changed the world. One of the people that was in that Houston meeting yes. was William Seymour. Yes. And so talk to us about how he was received in Houston, and then what happened when Will William Seymour went over to Azusa Street sure. in California? Sure. Uh, William Seymour, African-American man, his parents had been slaves. He was uh, raised in obscurity and poverty. At one time, they did an affidavit 
his his mother was trying to get a pension and they did an affidavit and the entire family's possessions was worth 65 cents. All of their furniture, all their clothes, everything they owned was valued at 65 cents. Uh, poverty like none of us can imagine. And also in a time of great racial discrimination, he was, uh, he was in, in, a, in an area where a group called the Knights of the White Camellia were like the KKK terrorizing African Americans. He escaped that, he went up north, uh, he got saved in Cincinnati, Ohio, no, in uh, Indianapolis, Indiana. He'd been in Chicago, went to Cincinnati, ended up then in Houston, and in Houston he met Charles Parham. And the way Seymour met Parham is, uh, Parham had a lady that was taking care of her kids and cooking for him and his family, and her name was Lucy Farrell. She was the pastor of a little holiness church in Houston. She went to Kansas with Paul and uh, Seymour pastored her church for a little while, at least preached in the church. And so he met Charles Parham. Charles Parham had a Bible school going there in Houston. He, was, he had these 12 week schools where he'd teach the fundamentals of the faith. And, and Seymour went to the school. Uh, I think I should mention there's a lot of, lot of discussion about whether or not Seymour was in the school or outside the school. Some people say he only sat in the hallway outside and the door was open. And that might have happened uh, maybe for a season, but there's a number of eyewitnesses who were there that says Seymour sat in the classroom. So I think there came a time that they accommodated him in the classes. But he and Charles Parham would preach together, but because of the Jim Crow laws at that time, Parham would preach to white people and Seymour would preach to black people. They had the races separated. And a lady there heard Seymour preach and invited him to come to Los Angeles and preach in their church in Los Angeles. And uh, that again changed the world. Seymour made his trip to Los Angeles. And when he got there, he preached in this hole in his church and preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which by the way, he had not received. And uh, the church rejected the teaching and locked him out of the church. He joined himself with a group of uh, praying people at uh, 214 Bonnie Bray Street where they were seeking God every night in cottage prayer meetings, Ruth and Richard Asbury. And uh, on April the 9th, 1906, while they were praying there at Bonnie Bray Street, the Holy Spirit fell. First on a man named Edward Lee at his home, and then they went over and it fell off the Bonnie Bray Street and the glory of God came down. A revival was birthed on April the 9th, 1906. Within a week, they couldn't hold their services in their little house. It was overflowing and people out in the street. So they looked for a building to rent, found a dilapidated old abandoned church that had been converted into a warehouse at 312 Azusa Street, moved in there. When they moved in, God moved in there with them. It's uh, probably the most famous address in Pentecostalism, one of the most famous addresses in Christianity, 312 Azusa Street, where God came down. What happened at the Azusa Street revival? It, it's, it's almost beyond description how God moved there. They, they had services three times a day 10 o'clock in the morning and at noon at 7 o'clock at night. But the 12 o'clock service, excuse me, the 10 o'clock service was still going at 12 and the 12 o'clock service did never stop before 7. So they were literally in service from 10 o'clock in the morning until after midnight, seven days a week. People came from all over the world. People would come to the train station. They had ambassadors there that would uh, meet them and bring them to the mission. People in Los Angeles would be doing their business. They'd hear the singing from Azusa Street. They'd stop and be captured by it. It's the Holy Spirit, they'd stay there for hours. Hundreds were saved. Hundreds of people healed and, and um, baptized in the Holy Spirit. Missionaries began to go out immediately to all the four corners of the earth and all across the U.S., spreading the Pentecostal message. When when it was born in Topeka and it crawled around in Oklahoma and Texas and stood, I mean, Oklahoma and Missouri, and, it's, uh, Arkansas, it stood up in Texas and it started running in California and literally ran around the world. And so people from all over came to Azusa Street. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. They began to speak in other tongues. And then many of them launched out as missionaries going to different parts of the world, spreading this message of the Holy Spirit. Let, let's talk about what God has done since then, because now if you look at global statistics, the fastest growing part of the church is the Pentecostal church. Uh, 
the people who believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Pentecostals originally were called Pentecostals because they believed in the power of Pentecost. And then uh, for a while they were called Charismatics because it comes from the, the Greek word uh, charisma, which means gift. They believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And, and now places like Oral Roberts University are using a, a new language to describe the same experience. They're, they're calling us spirit-empowered believers because over the years, the word Pentecostal, the word charismatic has picked up some baggage. And, and so there's a lot of people that they can agree with the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we are spirit-empowered believers. We believe in the, the move of the, the Holy Spirit. So kind of as a historian, kind of walk me through decade by decade from this the early 1910s until today, kind of what you feel that the Holy Spirit was doing in each decade as we've seen the growth of this Holy Spirit movement. Well, as we say, the revival began there at Azusa Street in 1906. It wasn't long after that, before the end of that decade, some of the Pentecostal denominations began to form. The uh, Church of God in Christ, the predominantly black Pentecostal denomination formed in the next decade, the Assemblies of God and the Pentecostal Church of God. As the movement really grew exponentially through all that period, uh, in the 40s and 50s, uh, it was marked by a great healing revival. Some of your your great heroes were out of that time period. Yeah, so you had the, the Voice of Healing movement, yes. which uh, really started with William Branham and then uh, uh, Gordon Lindsay, who started Christ for the Nations down in Dallas, Texas, uh, worked with, um, with Branham. And Branham was an uneducated prophet, but uh, Gordon Lindsay was a writer. And so he wrote some 200 books and, and really documented what God was doing. Then he started the Voice of Healing magazine and they featured articles from people like A.A. A. Allen, uh, T.L. Osborne. Uh, who else were part of the Voice of Healing? Uh, I think R.W. Schombach was later, later on. Later, a And uh, so, so they were featuring these stories of revivals that were, F.F. Uh, F. Bosworth was part of it, and, and featuring the stories of these different people that were doing revivals in different parts of the United States, and that spread uh, what God was doing during the Voice of Healing revival. All right, so that's that's the 40s and 50s. Then, then what started happening? By the way, let me say that you mentioned Gordon Lindsay there, a very important leader in that time period especially, but uh, he was saved in a meeting that Charles Parle was preaching. So it ties from the very beginning through Gordon Lindsay's ministry. And then in the 60s and 70s, the Pentecostal denominations continued to grow. And of course, there's always been independent fellowships associated with the Pentecostal charismatic movement or the spirit-empowered people, as you say. But the uh, 60s and 70s, the charismatic renewal began. Uh, probably most people mark the beginning of it with the uh, uh, pastor receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit at the Episcopal Church in Van Nuys, California. And uh, uh, he, he, he spread the message to denominational churches. And eventually Catholics began to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They had great Notre Dame conferences where where it was celebrated, this uh, Pentecostal movement among Catholics. And, uh, and you had David Duplessis, who was a big part of that. Uh, I, I remember hearing one of his sermons, I think it was preached at one of the, the gatherings of, of people uh, from all over the world, many different churches, and, and he quoted in Acts 2 it, the, the same verse that, that Peter quoted from the book of Joel that says, that uh, the Holy Spirit would be poured out upon all flesh. And so he said the Holy Spirit being poured out, that's the charismatic movement upon all flesh. That is the ecumenical movement. And so God does not want to be confined to just one denomination or one group of people. The Holy Spirit is available for people from every different faith tradition. Uh, anyone who reaches out towards God uh, the Holy Spirit is there to 
fill them and to give them power to be a witness. Absolutely. And uh, those, uh, the charismatic renewal, though it was uh, extremely strong in the 60s and 70s, it continues today. There's still uh, a lot of those uh, early charismatics tried to stay within their denomination, but a lot of them were rejected by their denomination and they ended up forming into independent fellowships or merging into established denominations that have continued to grow. I think one of the greatest growths today in America is uh, among the Hispanics. And we see so many his uh, uh, immigrants from uh, Latin American countries where they've experienced great Pentecostal revival. I know particularly in the Assemblies of God, all of the growth in the Assemblies of God is just about among the ethnic minorities. And you mentioned Africa, uh, great missionaries from Azusa Street went to Africa and started the work there and it's continued and it's just exploded with men like Reinhard Bonnke and others doing campaigns there till today. Uh, one estimate, and, and different people give you a different number, one estimate 650 million spirit-filled people in the world today, uh, the largest block in Protestant Christianity. I think it's the greatest revival in the history of the Christian church, what God has done the last 125 years through the Pentecostal movement. So I'm, I'm working on a book on the history of evangelism and what God has done uh, through evangelists throughout the world. And there's been a lot of research on people like, like Billy Graham and uh, uh, George Whitfield, uh, Jonathan Edwards, some of these early American evangelists, you know, Billy Sunday, great uh, evangelist at the, the turn of the century. Um, but there hasn't been that much research done on the Hispanic world. And so I'm, in my book, I'm trying to document uh, what God's been doing in the Hispanic world, what God's been doing in Africa, because there are great men of God in Africa that no one in America has heard of, but they've been responsible for millions of people coming into the kingdom of God. And so one of the early Hispanic healing evangelists, I don't know if you've heard of this guy, uh, Francisco uh, Ozalabal. He was a Pentecostal healing evangelist, and he was... Uh, one of the ones who went to the Azusa Street Revival filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began doing revivals among all of the Hispanics in America. And from his ministry, four different Hispanic Pentecostal de denominations were, were formed in the early 1900s. Wow. And, and so it's really neat. And, and, and then you have great Hispanic evangelists throughout history that have taking the power of the Holy Spirit. People like Cash Luna, Carlos Anacondia from Ar Argentina, Claudio Frazon from uh, Argentina, and just great pastors from all over the, the Hispanic world where God is really moving in a great way. Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, another interesting fact, Daniel, about the success of this movement, the largest church in the world is a Pentecostal charismatic church in Seoul, Korea. Uh, that being said, of course, the largest church in Asia, which would be that church is charismatic, Pentecostal. The largest church in Europe is a spirit-empowered church. The largest church in Africa is a spirit-empowered church. The largest church in South America, spirit, largest church in the United States is a spirit-empowered church. And no one dreamed in these early days of the outpouring that, it, that uh, I guess those involved might have dreamed it, but the world certainly did not dream the success of the movement. One, one man who was a denominational leader in one of the holiness denominations observed the Azusa Street Revival and he said, if you threw a pebble into the ocean, it would make more waves than what this revival will bring to the world. And if any man should ever be recorded as the worst prophet in human history, that would be the man. Because There have been waves that continue to this day. All right, now let's look into the future. What do you see the Holy Spirit doing over the next few years? Well, what can we look for and what should we be praying for? Well, obviously we're praying for revival. Uh, places, as you mentioned, like Africa are on fire for God. And church is growing by leaps and bounds in many nations in Africa. So many, so many more millions of Pentecostal believers in Africa. And in, in, for Brazil, for example, there's, there's probably uh, a uh, quote from the Assemblies of God, there's probably 20 times more Assembly of God people in Brazil than there are in the United States. And God's going to continue to move in Asia and Africa and Central America, South America. We need to pray that that same spirit of revival will sweep across the United States. And 
I'm just believing God for that. I was praying one time and after the great revival at Brownsville, and it seemed like that, uh, well, Dr. Cho prophesied and said the revival would spread from Brownsville to the whole United States. And we didn't see that happen. or hasn't happened as of yet. And I was praying one time and I felt like the Lord spoke to me that revival was like a hurricane. I lived down on the coast for a while in Pensacola. When a hurricane stalls out off the coast, if a, if a hurricane is, you know, uh, five miles out, 10 miles out, and it stalls, it's not going away. It's just gaining strength when it hovers over those warm waters. And I believe that the power of the Holy Spirit is uh, maybe has stalled, but it's not losing out. It's gaining strength. And I'm praying that uh, America gets hit by Category 5 revival that will sweep millions into the kingdom. Amen. Well, as you're listening, if you want to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, just like on the day of Pentecost, I encourage you to, to pray and ask for the Holy Spirit. God will give you uh, and, and fill you with the Holy Spirit, and you will have power to, to be a witness and, and to share the gospel uh, around the world. Uh, let's just finish with a word of prayer and, and uh, encourage the people who are listening that uh, the same Holy Spirit that we saw on the day of Pentecost, that we saw in the early years of the Pentecostal movement, uh, can impact them today. Amen. I've probably said this a thousand times in meetings, but I want to say it again today for you. The reason we talk about history is not to live in the past. We don't want to live in the past. We're living today and we're living for tomorrow. But we talk about history because if God ever did anything, He can do that thing again. And if God ever moved in one place, God can move in any place. And if God ever moved on one person, then God can move on any person. That means you, where you are, and at this time, God can do for you anything that He's ever done through any of the great people we study about in history. And God wants to do that for you. And we're going to pray right now that God will use you. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for this podcast, the opportunity to share a little bit of the history of your work. Lord, it's not the work of man because everything that man touches becomes just human, but it is divine. And we thank you, Lord, that you've moved among men, that you've used faithful men like Parham and Seymour and Gordon Lindsay and all the others we've talked about today, that you've used these men to bring the message of Christ to a lost and dying world. Lord, I pray for everyone listening to this podcast today. I, if there's anyone that doesn't know you, I pray that the Holy Spirit will bring them to you. But Lord, those that are believers and are listening today, I pray you give them a new power. I pray that you give them a fresh vision, Lord. Show them today that as God used others, God can use them. I pray that the same mantle of the Holy Spirit that was in Topeka, the same mantle of the Holy Spirit that was at Azusa Street, that that mantle will fall across their shoulders right now. I pray for a fresh and a new anointing. I ask you, Lord, that you would use these listeners to take this gospel to the whole world and change this world for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Larry Martin. Thank you. Daniel King is on a mission to save one million souls a year, but he can't do it alone. Would you consider sowing a financial seed today? To give, please visit www.kingministries.com.